to provide us with uh, some information and uh, uh, talk about his experiences that's going to really inspire us and set us off for the rest of the conference. Welcome, Paul Young. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Catherine. And, uh, oh, great. Thanks, Brent. Thanks for um, your support of the Maple Leafs. I'm not actually a huge hockey fan, but I was, I was heartened to see, you know, it's under, right behind uh, Montreal. Um, so I'm, I'm actually, I feel very privileged to be here. I've always wanted to come to St. John's, hadn't had the opportunity, so... Um, I want to thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Catherine, for hunting me down. <laughs> um, uh, thanks to the sponsors as well. Uh, it's a, an amazing um, a turnout and, a, and I think a great cross-section of people and a real testament to the hard work of the folks that are working behind the scenes. Um, I have a, quite a number of slides. It's, a, it's a, quite a broad topic area. Um, and I, and I may have to kind of zip through them, but I just wanted to let you know that they all will be available online, apparently, at some point. Um, so you don't need to scribble if there's an interesting point. But there will be questions throughout. As Greg mentioned, there's some polling. And uh, if, you, if something resonates with you in particular, write it down, because I'm going to ask you some questions as we go through. Um, <laughs> As Sandy mentioned, I come in with a bit of a, you know, baggage from Toronto. Uh, but this happens to me all the time. I don't actually do a lot of work in Toronto. It's usually around Toronto um, in smaller uh, communities, often rural, um, you know, around this size and smaller. Uh, so I have to apologize if you see examples in there that look like Toronto or, um, you know, Ontario. I'll apologize in advance. There are some good examples, but there are also some... Um, Controversial ones. I, I managed to work the mayor in there, our mayor, <laughs> which you may have heard about, and Mark Delahanty. So, uh, <laughs> uh, my experience has been primarily um, I, I'm a landscape architect, so I was trained in designing streets and parks, that kind of thing. And I got more interested in public participation because when the public got involved, they seemed to be asking questions that were, you know, really to the point and, and, um, and practical, and so bringing my health uh, component together with my design, I feel like I'm kind of pulling people into the design process and, and, and trying to get them to influence designs of cities and towns. And it's been fun, and it's a fun thing to get involved with. Um, interesting. I'm not a researcher. Uh, most of the stuff I've got up here is someone else's research, and I'm grateful for all the folks that are working uh, to produce that research because I think it's a uh, it's really needed, especially in a sector that is working on evidence-based um, practices. Um, I, I, uh, I look forward to, I'll share some of the ideas that, that I've observed over, over the time, but I also look forward to your input because I know uh, you are the experts here, and that's really what this is all about, you taking control over your own um, communities and, and situations. Um, so this is forward. Should I be shooting this at? Uh... Oh, here. Okay. Right. All right. So as I mentioned, I'm a landscape architect designing streets and parks. I'm also a health promoter. I work in a small community health center in the area of South Riverdale. Uh, primarily around, uh, I promote engagement in planning, uh, a lot of pollution issues. We've got a lot of industrial uh, uses in the area, and people want to know how to change that. And I'm, uh, I'm working as a planner, so I'm looking at policy. Uh, more and more people are interested in official planning and how we can uh, develop official plans so they support cycling and walking. And when we talk about the built environment, we're talking about built thought. Basically, as soon as you step outside the building, inside the building, you look around, everyone's thought about the carpet, the lights, you know, and then we manufactured it and built it. So uh, it's really... This is Health Canada's definition. It includes our homes, schools, workplaces, parks, rec areas, business areas, and roads. And as far as uh, this talk today, first I'd like to go through how the built environment affects our health. And I think, uh, you know, th there's a number of points to be made. I'm not sure they're going to be a big surprise to you, but uh, I thought I should include it. 
The second part, characteristics of a healthy built environment. I'll talk a little bit about you know, examples of what things uh, could be like. And then the third part, strategies. And I think that's what we're focused on here today, so I'm probably going to zip through the first two categories a little more quickly. How the built community affects health. Um, I do quite a bit of work with the Ontario Healthy Communities Coalition, and they had a project a few years back that was funded through Health Canada to look at the research on this very topic. Um, just a quick little uh, planning uh, 101 here. I, this is like simplified beyond belief, but um, back in the early days, uh, turn of the century, we left the city for health reasons, typically, uh, full of industry and, and air pollution, that kind of thing, to live in the country in the 50s, and we built highways to get back to work, and we and ended up taking out a lot of the transit. Um, we separated all our uses, so all the industries over there, all the housings over there, and we've got big distances to travel now. And so in terms of trends, uh, two components of the built environment, land use and the transportation infrastructure. In terms of land use, some of the trends, we've got separated housing, work, and, and uh, public places, long distances. Single uses concentrated in a large area, so the typical um, poster child for that is the big box power center. Uh, uses separated by wide, busy roads. Distances have grown, and we're pretty dependent on our cars. In terms of the transportation trends, we've got widening streets, dead ends, increasing car ownership, increasing congestion, and apparently you have congestion here. I wasn't sure, but uh, got talking to some folks in town, and yep, it's here. Um, expanding roads to accommodate those uh, expanding uh, traffic volumes. We've got big fire trucks and snow plows that also dictate the width of our roads. And in fact, it's kind of ironic, we've got fewer travel options and less mobility, especially if you don't have access to a car. So we know these two components uh, are the built environment and the different things they've had impacts on. I'm just going to go through these uh, one by one. Levels of physical activity, I'm sure that's something that's close to many, many folks' hearts here. And this wouldn't be any surprise to you, 51% of Canadian adults are not getting enough physical activity and 91% of children and youth in the same boat. 60% uh, of Canadian adults are overweight or obese, 26% of Canadian uh, children and youth. So I'm going to do the old style poll, show of hands. When you were a kid, did you get to walk to school? Yeah? Okay, see, it works too, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> okay. So I feel pretty lucky. These are my guys walking to school. Um, well, when we compare it around the world, we're not doing so great. Um, I'm just trying to find the, the pointer. Is a laser? No, it's here. Okay, that's fine. So just a comparison around the world. You can see in the European countries, we've got a much higher percentage of kids walking to school. There's Canada down there at about 25%. And we know in terms of chronic disease, um, in, in our health center, I don't work in, um, in, on the clinical side I'm in health promotion, but our diabetes department has grown. Uh, we have a total of about 80 people in the health center, and I think we've got about 15 people now in the diabetes program. And it's all about managing diabetes. This is not even getting in front of the, of the epidemic. So it's increased 70% over the last 10 years. And there is definitely a connection between uh, being overweight and the diabetes. 80 to 90% of people with type 2 diabetes are overweight or obese. And physical activity, inactivity is linked to all these other chronic diseases as well. So the built environment varies depending on where you live. So there's some research emerging now that says, well, maybe we can start to map some of the factors that are influencing physical activity. And here are some. This is out of St. Mike's Hospital in Toronto. There's a, a research team there. They're starting to map the age of the neighborhood, car ownership levels, access to grocery stores, access to transit and bike lanes, access to recreation, and the number of services that are nearby. And this is what it looks like when you combine all those into an activity-friendly index. So these are early days, but they're looking at diabetes and, and they're comparing it to this activity-friendly index. So you'll see those circles of yellow. That's where they've got low activity-friendly uh, uh, index readings. And that happens to be where the diabetes levels are the highest. Now, there are other factors, of course, diet, income, 
but they've accounted for income in this particular uh, slide, and they've found areas that are relatively low income that have a high de- uh, ac- recreation, uh, sorry, activity-friendly index and low rates of diabetes. So in terms of Newfoundland and Labrador and how it compares to Canada, um, you know, relatively similar in terms of how many people are driving and how many people are taking walking, uh, um, sorry, taking their bike and walking. Cycling is a little lower, I noticed, in St. John's. I was going to rent a bike here, and then I, you know, Google Maps only gives you so much information. <laughs> Those hills are, are looking pretty killer. <laughs> um, so that was Canada and, and Newfoundland and Labrador. This is around the world. So when we start to look uh, more globally, you'll see Canada and U.S. on the left side there down around 10% of uh, of people are biking, walking, taking transit. And then there's old Denmark at the other end, 55%, so they're really doing well. But you can see that, you know, in a global perspective, we're not doing so great on that front. And then some uh, interesting research coming out of the U.S., they've compared the percentage of people who are obese. And, you know, the question is, is there a correlation there? Um, Here in... uh, in Newfoundland Labrador, um, I think you've got the highest uh, levels of diabetes of any of the provinces, and it's up around 20% for folks who are living on reserves. Um, is that a surprise to anybody here? No? Um, and, you know, there, there's reason for hope. <laughs> Most people want to walk and bike more, um, and they also would support, according to the polls, these polls were done quite a while ago by a national organization called Go for Green. support government spending on bike lanes and paths in their community. And yet we're all sort of stuck in the gym. You know, not everybody, but there's a lot of... I noticed last night walking down Water Street, all these people up there pumping away. um, So we've got a huge opportunity, replacing short driving trips with walking and biking. 66% of Canadians live within a short trip, 30-minute walk of a routine destination, and 80% are within a half-hour cycle. And so here are the trip distances traveling to work. Um, at, down at the bottom, you've got Canada, 25%. Uh, 25% of people are traveling five kilometers or less, so relatively short trip. And Newfoundland and Labrador, it's 42% are traveling those relatively short trips. Um, so that's a huge opportunity. Our kids today, this is a shot of a, um, anyone know what that is? A drop off in front of a school. Right, so, <laughs> uh, and interestingly, some great work um, uh, done, a research that shows that most kids would prefer to cycle and walk. And if the distance is less than a kilometer, um, 80% would, will walk. So how can we make it easier for people to walk and bike and boost physical activity levels? Well, one, one option is everyday travel. So another aspect of built environment air quality Living next to a busy road can reduce life expectancy by 2.5 years. Urban sprawl is, uh, you know, there's a, definitely a connection between greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. Transportation causes 26% of greenhouse gases in Canada, and they're rising. So how does this affect Newfoundland and Labrador? I heard something on the news the other day that the fish stocks are actually connected to global warming. Vehicle crashes, pedestrian and cyclist safety is another aspect. In Canada, over 400 cyclists and and, uh, pedestrians are killed a year. 60 kids are killed a year, and it's entirely preventable. That's one child every six days. Um, We know there are simple things like speed reduction, right? So if you can get the speed down to 30 kilometers an hour, if a child is one in child, one in 20 kids would be killed at that speed. Uh, Up at 65 kilometers an hour, most kids would be killed. And the good news, you know, the good news, uh, in 25 years, there's been an 80% reduction on injuries and death in Germany and 70% in the the Netherlands. And they've been working at this for 25 years. Access and proximity to food, I mentioned earlier, we're losing a lot of our class one, two, and three farmland uh, from urban sprawl. I'm not sure that's the case here in in Newfoundland, Labrador, but um, it does have an impact on our food production. And then in terms of access to grocery stores and and, uh, healthy foods nearby, this is a map that models uh, what we call food deserts, that in the areas that are red uh, indicates that there's nothing around there uh, for for folks to buy food within an easy walk. So this is part of that diabetes study, and this is factored into that uh, activity-friendly index. 
mental health. So I'm talking about quality of life, sense of community, and sense of control over how things are evolving in your community. Then we have a, a growing sense of isolation as people, more and more people are trapped in cars. So you see the number of cars on the right going up, uh, and then the number of people per car uh, going down. So you, know, you see that every day, people commuting into work, one person in the car. You know, don't get me wrong, cars are a great technology. It's just I think we're not really using them the best way we can. Um, isolation and growing hostility. You may have experienced being stuck in a traffic jam. Um, we get it in Toronto, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, and then the quote on the bottom, we can't solve congestion, the congestion problem with cars. It's mathematically impossible. You can't keep widening the roads and widening the roads. And... In order to increase tra capacity here for, for mobility, you could double the capacity of, of the road on the right just by adding another bus. So it doesn't mean you have to widen it up. There's an impact from traffic collisions and fatality on friends and family. Um, being stuck in traffic means that you have uh, limited time to interact with your neighbors, so there's kind of an erosion of social capital. You might not get involved in community activities if your, your time is so limited. And the most affected people are women, children, and the elderly. So this is a poster. I went to a great conference in Vancouver called Walk 21, and I stayed with uh, friends who used to be neighbors in Toronto, and they had this poster up on the wall in the, in the hallway. And I thought, oh, that's funny. <laughs> so this is what the view looks like from downtown Toronto, and then 15 kilometers from Vancouver, uh, oh, boy, you could be in a kayak. So I, th I thought to myself, well, this is kind of similar. Like St. John's, I, I suppose you could be kayaking down there as well. But I suspect that traffic congestion shot was actually taken in Vancouver because they have the same problem there. Um, but I just asked the question, you know, uh, in terms of quality of life, this is a poster that speaks to, you know, come and visit us and, and or maybe even relocate here. And I think a lot of municipalities want to do that. They want to attract investment and people. But we have to be careful. We don't end up like the image on the top. So travel has an impact on quality of life. And quality of life, they're starting to break that down a bit as an indicator. So you can rank cities based on their quality of life, the quality of life that they offer. So if you're in a head office somewhere, you're looking to relocate, quality of life index is something that you may want to consider. If you're an employee and you have the freedom to pick from a number of uh, places to work, quality of life is something you might want to consider. And the percentage of walking and cycling is uh, one of those indicators of, of quality of life. And, you know, we need places to meet, sidewalks, front porches, shops, to interact. Uh, I'd love to commute to work like this. <laughs> but uh, the quote, I think, is interesting because it talks about what we do with our money and what we do with our time. I'd rather bike to a restaurant than drive to the gym. Um, connection to place, that's uh, you know, something that it's a little bit tough to pin down, but when you think about culture and the landscape, um, low density sprawl, bedroom communities, there's a loss of natural heritage and a loss of farmlands and a bit of a loss of sense of place. And you get into situations like this, like I don't know, do you recognize where this uh, slide is from? Could be anywhere, I think. Um, but the question is, you know, you've got uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken and New York Fries and uh, Boston Pizza. It's really like it could be anywhere. It's, it, it, and we've lost um, our sense of place. So the question, where are we? Who are we? Um, there's a bit of a loss of culture and a loss of control. I think most people I speak to feel like they don't know how this happened. It's just, you know, something that we live with every day. And I think of, um, in Ontario, some of the uh, First Nations communities where um, there are all sorts of challenges, and, and a lot of it comes back to this feelings of loss of culture and loss of control. So I wonder what you know, we're doing to ourselves with this kind of thing. And we have a little poll. So I'll read it out to you and get your clickers ready. I think my neighbors feel they do have control over how our communities are growing. So you can strongly agree, agree, you're neutral, you disagree, or strongly disagree. So do you think your neighbors feel like they have a lot of control over the way things are growing? Oh. 
Okay, results are in. So disagree. Most people don't think there's a lot. And I think that's, that's my sense as well. So let's talk about equity, fairness, and access, how the built environment affects that. So a third of North Americans don't drive. Those hardest hit, the elderly, and that number is growing. If you're dependent on a car, your mobility is, uh, is very limited. People with disabilities may not have access to a car. All children under 16 and folks who can't afford a car. So if you're on a fixed income, low income, um, chances are you may not have a car and you're going to be limited. And there's a small percentage of people who choose not to drive. And for those that choose not to drive, um, one car, this is a fairly conservative estimate, $620 a month. Um, if you go to the Canadian Automobile Association, I think it's closer to $750 a month. But if you channel that money into a retirement savings plan, there's a million dollars at the end of 25 years. Over in the college savings, $200,000 a home mortgage, and so this affects housing affordability. There's some discussions in Calgary recently where they're starting to map what's affordable to you if you have an income of, say, $50,000. If you have a car, you're limited to this neighborhood. If you don't have a car, you can afford to live downtown, which are downtowns are becoming increasingly desirable places to live. Accessibility. So this is fairly straightforward in some ways. Um, this is just a shot from a street uh, nearby and a uh, crosswalk with no curb cuts. So if you're in a wheelchair or a walking walker, that's going to be difficult for you to get across. And snow clearing is another issue I noticed here in town. Um, sort of a, a few challenges walking on the sidewalks. Um, and in terms of the built environment, I don't talk a whole lot about housing, but this is definitely a big piece of it. Inclusive communities provide a range of housing types. So if uh, I think I picked up in the media that there's definitely a shortage of housing for students in St. John's, and uh, maybe we're not building it. Uh, maybe there's a, a, a shortage there. Um, so, you know, building housing for all life stages. So if you're a senior and you want to age in place, you don't have to move out because there's nowhere for you to live. Um, and then, of course, benches, restrooms, those are all things, aspects of our built environment that provide for different ages. So another poll, I think we are designing our communities and transport systems with equity in mind. Strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. The question is, I think we are designing our communities with trans and transport systems with equity in mind. Survey says... You guys remember that show? <laughs> okay, disagree. So most people disagree. And I, I would tend to agree as well. Water quality, the last piece. Uh, the more we pave, the more runoff we get, and it's very expensive to deal with the amount of um, storm water. It carries all sorts of pollutants into, in, in our case, into the fresh water, in your case, into groundwater, I think, at some point. Um, Anything else that our built environment affects? I think Sandy mentioned this. This is from the Ontario Medical Association. The cost of chronic disease is growing. Again, I don't think that's any big surprise to you folks. Today, our healthcare in, in Ontario spends almost half of every um, program dollar on uh, healthcare. And that's, uh, that could consume uh, 70 cents of every dollar in 12 years. That's chronic disease. And I guess... Um, and Catherine mentioned that money is going to come in all likelihood from other programs. So what about disease prevention? You know, we talk quite a bit about the evil three, diet, exercise, and smoking. And I think in the past it's been about lifestyle choices. And now we're looking more at public policy, that this isn't just a lifestyle choice to hop in my car and drive in in the comfort of, you know, it's, you know, I don't have a lot of options. There's no sidewalk, there's no bike lane. Um, and so the idea of health promotion, uh, the idea that we're going upstream. Do you think we should have a strong fence at the top of the cliff or a state-of-the-art uh, state of the art fleet of ambulances at the bottom? <laughs> My brother, who's a paramedic, might, you know, argue with a... <laughs> uh, no, he definitely understands this. Uh, again, another example, do you want clean air or do you want puffers for everybody? 
So in summary, this whole health piece, uh, this is a cartoonist, it's a little dark, but uh, <laughs> I like his stuff. Ooh, I like the expression. <laughs> so a little bit about characteristics of a healthy built environment to support health. Um, just to point that it's very context specific. So we've got rural conditions, suburban conditions, and urban conditions. And there are a number of ways to improve uh, the built environment based more or less on which context you're working in. I'm going to talk about four basic categories. You can see them on the bar along the top. That'll give you an idea where we're at. Complete communities, complete streets, connectivity, built form, and urban design. So these are all aspects of a healthy built environment. Mixed use and density are a big part of what makes a complete community. So I'll talk about mixed use and the idea that uh, you have a fine grain of mixed, mixed uses. So not like the slide you see in front of you where you've got all the shopping over there and all the housing on the right. Mixed use is more looking like this, so a little bit like what you see downtown. And this is not a nostalgic thing. I think we're learning from what we did 100 years ago. And the image on the bottom right is a brand new community uh, north of Toronto uh, that looks a lot like the older communities. And the idea is they're trying to promote walking, they're trying to promote health. And uh, they've mixed the uses. So you've got retail, groceries, restaurants, transit, work, public services, all within a five, 10 minute bike uh, or walk, ideally. So this is a little slide. I struggle with this to try and explain what happens when we move towards a larger format or regional uses. And you know, we always, I think about the big box retail, but we're also doing big box rec centers. Uh, we're doing big box schools. These are regional complexes that have a huge draw. So this is what things might have been like. If you imagine the orange is, is residential, that's my house in the blue. Um, and all, and all the little blue boxes are retail, say, um, uses. So each retail use has a trade area. You can see the little circles around that service that area. And I can easily walk to any one of those. Then along comes the big box. And there's not enough dollars to go around. So the smaller retail shops uh, fold up. And my distance grows, and it's huge. And that's happening. This is a little town outside Toronto, Milton where the article here is about um, these folks who, who've lived there all their lives and now they have to drive outside the town to get their everyday needs because there's a, a, a lot of big box retail outside the town and it's meant that the downtown has moved more to a boutique kind of uh, retail service. So uh, just a brief word about density. People sometimes get a little itchy when you mention the word density. They think of like these 40-story towers and... So many municipalities are putting up images to help people understand what density really means, what it can look like, and then some of the benefits. So as density goes up, you can actually um, bring in transit. So this, the second column in is units per hectare, and then the last column indicates how much uh, transit, what kind of transit service you can expect. So in a place like St. John's, it has enough density to support good bus service. In a place like Boston, this is a little bit higher at uh, 53 units per acre. This was 37 units per hectare, and this is bringing it up a bit to 53. You could possibly uh, have light rail here. But I think the, the message is more that you don't have to have crazy tall apartment buildings to enable, and it doesn't all have to be subways or, or uh, streetcars. Growth boundaries are very important. The image on the top shows what happens when you do low-density sprawl. So you've got all sorts of development and the compact density on the bottom. And the, and the typical planning tool is to set a growth boundary on the municipality. Complete streets. So I would engage you typically in a question, you know, is this street complete? Why or why not? You can see the sidewalk ends, and there's a little pathway there where people have continued walking. But if I were in a wheelchair or with my grandmother, this is not complete, and it's not working for her. So a complete street is, is more one that will quote on the side. They're safe, comfortable, and convenient for travel, if you're in an automobile, foot, bicycle, or transit. And <laughs> so where are we in Canada? I kind of think, unfortunately, we're closer to the bottom image. Same with complete streets. There's no cookie-cutter, uh, one-size-fits-all design. So these are complete streets from all over. Uh, the one on the top is from the Netherlands. And there's many different types, and there's also, you know, maintenance is a big part of this uh, complete streets piece. 
And the European example, uh, we're closer to the left on the U.S. How many people are biking and walking? And then over there on the right is the Netherlands. And then they've got far fewer deaths uh, and, and accidents. Which, this is the argument, uh, there's safety in numbers. So the more people you get out on the street biking and walking, the safety improves. It's not necessarily about helmets. And the good news on injuries and deaths, I said this before, I'll say it again, in 25 years they've had a big reduction in Germany and in the Netherlands. And they've been investing in this. Uh, complete streets are safer, I mentioned earlier. There's one on the bottom right for Vancouver, where you've got the, the bicycle way right off the road. Complete streets are connected. So this is a system of greenways, a bit like the concourse system here in St. John's where they've designated streets and they're reconstructing them uh, to accommodate bicycles, pedestrians, and transit. And there's that bike route that's separated off on the side there. Uh, and connectivity is a big piece of the street network as well. That's important not to have to walk, if you're going from A to B, uh, two kilometers. That's a one kilometer distance as the crow flies, but just because our road network is laid out in these squiggly dead worm pattern uh, makes it more difficult. So this is um, work coming out of uh, research done by Lawrence Frank, another landscape architect who's completely off the rails. <laughs> Crossings, uh, block lengths need to be shorter so that we don't end up with a situation on the, on the left. And then a continuity of streetscape. For some reason, these barricades went down. And uh, you know, if I'm trying to get across there, especially with somebody who might be older, that's a, a big barrier. Connectivity can be achieved through the use of you know, varying types of infrastructure just a simple pathway uh, connecting streets. Uh, on the bottom image is a recreational system integrated with a sidewalk system, so you have a, a number of options. And uh, an important point here, in terms of trails, not just for recreation. It can be for everyday trips as well. And I think when I talked about the short trips earlier on, the trail system can really help if it's connected in to other uses along the trail. Um, in this case, there's a grocery store. You can just see the tip of the building there. It's a price chopper, we call it. Uh, so you could ride your bike, go in to get your groceries, and continue on. The last category of characteristics, we talk about built form and urban design. So that's the zone that's it's kind of a little bit mushy, but it's in between the road and the building. How does the building meet the street? So in this case, you've got two contrasting examples. Uh, the one on the top... A little more transparent in terms of the building itself. It has windows on the street. You can, you can be inside and look out. It feels safer. You've got a little bit of shelter from the rain there if you need it. The building on the right, they put a fair bit of effort into the streetscape, so they got some decorative paving there and some nice bollard lighting and, and, uh, and planting. But the building itself is brutal. And that's a shopping mall, and apparently they've put windows in there since this slide was taken. So you can imagine if you're walking down that street around 10 o'clock at night, you happen to be a woman, um, it might not feel so great. Uh, built form and urban design, we talk about the lane widths. The, the <laughs> I get into these uh, negotiations with um, engineers typically about how wide the, the, the lane actually has to be um, because in the, in the bottom left slide, the, the more room we can get for the, for the public realm, that uh, sidewalk, the, the more comfortable it is for walking. So... Um, when you've got these great huge lane widths, it eats into the sidewalk and it means you can't have trees and, or bike lanes, that kind of thing. And the details matter. So when we're putting in utilities, are we accommodating street trees, that kind of thing. Just one slide here on building green. Uh, huge topic. How do we make our, our built environment more environmentally friendly? This is a building that's pretty much off the grid. It's a couple of blocks north of where I live. It was a CMHC design competition. We can do this. The technology is there. Those buildings are like 10 years old now. Um, but the developers are saying we need more supportive bylaws. So our planning controls are out of sync with the direction we want to go. And then the, uh, the last piece, just a little bit about sustainable open space. I think we're going to hear more about that today. Uh, leaving places for stormwater uh, recharge, um, having habitat uh, creation, and porous paving. Just a few considerations. Preserving a sense of place. What cultural elements do we want to preserve in the landscape and in our built environment? Okay, so this is moving into more strategy. So how are we going to move into you know, places that we want to be that are more supportive? This was a poll that was done uh, back in 08. And 
in terms of you know, who should take the blame for all our eco woes, most people think that it's, you know, people need to take personal responsibility. And the question I have is, that are, are our governments and municipalities making it easier or harder for us to, to take that personal responsibility? Am I going to look like an idiot you know, cycling into work? You know, I nearly get killed every day. My family's wondering what I'm doing. You know, that's not the situation we should be in. This is really about values and decisions in, you know, for the long term about how we want to live. Uh, some of the research work we did with the Ontario Healthy Communities Coalition, they said, you know, well, well you got some programs going here. What worked for you? And the success of the policies and initiatives, they listed four points. There was strong community support and awareness. There was media coverage, strong partnerships, which I think we heard earlier, and commitment of the membership. And they were less successful due to the lack of leadership, lack of resources, uh, lack of budget, of course, uh, follow-up programs, and lack of professional planning, resource, and government support. So no surprises there, I don't think. Boiling it down a bit, I think there seems to be agreement. You need to have support from the top, some leadership, and uh, push from the bottom from the community saying that they'd like to see this stuff happen. There's a report that came out recently called Active Transportation in Canada. And I'd encourage you, it's online, it's, uh, it's free, uh, put out by Transport Canada. And they have kind of a you know, fairly involved process there. I, I'm just going to boil that down a little bit. Um, promoting engagement, this is what I'll talk about in a little more detail. First point, promoting engagement. Second point, planning and transportation policy. Uh, third, looking at partnerships. And the fourth, how can we build a more supportive culture so people aren't throwing pop cans at the cyclists? Uh, encouraging community and stakeholders to problem solve together. Why engage the community? And um, there's a number of reasons. Transparency, it's an opportunity for people to learn together about some of the challenges you face and some of the challenges we face as a user. Uh, the user experience is crucial, especially when it comes to seniors, youth. Um, Catherine O'Brien's going to speak later on about uh, some of the work she's doing, but great research on youth uh, and their experience of our built environment. Good engagement saves time and money in the long run. And it's important to unpack some of the commitments that we've made and the policies that we have. And uh, engagement is often legally required, especially in terms of planning and transportation projects. And it builds a constituency of support. So if you've got a supportive uh, or an engaged community, you can uh, count on them to support it when it comes to council and things. Uh, one of the examples I encounter over and over again is uh, opposition to new development uh, that happens to look a little different. Uh, maybe a little more dense. And I think there's a lack of understanding typically about how the benefits from that kind of development. Um, so here's a quote. We have a, a you know, transportation problem in Toronto. It's fairly, it keeps growing. But uh, and one of the leaders uh, in, in Toronto uh, teaches at the University of Toronto, director of the city center, Eric Miller. This is a quote that he ha opened with um, in, a, in a press release. We really have to get the city, particularly people in the suburbs, being a little more thoughtful about their city and the transportation system so they can push the politicians. So a couple of elements stood out for me there. Pushing the politicians, getting people engaged. And typical challenges we face, and when I go out into communities and talk about this issue, what can one person do? And this is you know, a, a slide from Baltimore, but it's, uh, they were trying to encourage people to get involved. Pedestrians are typically not organized. That's just one group. Cyclists a little bit more organized, but similar. They don't have the opportunity to talk about this kind of stuff. And I think how many people had to walk as part of their day today, you know, from the bedroom to the kitchen and then you know, to the car or wherever. It's part of our day, right? It's every day. So not many people identify as pedestrians. Uh, and planners, recreation staff, public health engineers, they need the public and political support for density and active transportation infrastructure. Those are two of the challenges that I encounter quite a bit. Um, so learning together is a, an opportunity. Find out again how the health, impa how, how health, Im the, the health impacts of our built environment. And then it's also an opportunity to celebrate some of the work we're doing. Like everyone's doing great work in every municipality that I go to. Um, promoting engagement, just a brief note on collaboration. The more collaboration we have, the more commitment we have to a program, more investment of time and ownership of the, of the initiative and complexity of relationships. So just a plug here for fostering collaboration. So 
community engagement, it means different things to different people. I think of a public meeting sometimes, so um, I think, oh, who likes public meetings? In my profession, public meetings are uh, a little nerve-wracking sometimes. Um, so I don't know about you. Here's another poll. Get your little clickers ready. Engaging the public. I'll just read it out. I or my department or group feel right at home setting up and facilitating public meetings. We do them all the time. We love them. Strongly agree. Agree. Neutral. Disagree. Strongly disagree. So this is one of those polls where I think it's an advantage to have it kind of anonymous. <laughs> the results are coming in. Okay, so, like me, we don't always love public meetings. And I think it has to do with this fear of the unknown, right? Like, it takes a fair bit of planning, and um, this is one example that I thought of. How many people saw this interview? That was pretty entertaining. <laughs> so we have our challenges. Um, but I think a lot of it had to do with, you know, just who is this person? What, what, the, what do they want from me? And, you know, ah, just an inability to deal with it. And I think that's something we encounter when we go into a public meeting. I'm not trained in, in public uh, um, engagement or facilitation of meetings. Or I had a little weenie course in a planning called Small Groups and Planning. And that was how to work with a group of maybe eight people so that everyone gets a chance to talk, that kind of thing. But this is fairly... Um, uncharted territory for most people who are trained in, in a number of professions. So I think the idea is that we may to, need to make it easy for people to participate, provide a range of opportunities. So uh, Greg and Jamie Lee have given you that uh, great clicker thing, which is kind of fun. There's a whole, you know, you, surveys, workshops, events. And the, the last point, making it safe. And I think this is something that I've learned, especially with staff uh, coming to an engagement process where they're like, is there going to be politicians there? You know, and <laughs> so are my managers coming? So it, we have to figure out ways to make this a safe environment. Um, just a note about people participating in different ways. This is a project I was involved in pushing for a bike lane. It took quite a while, uh, but we had workshops. We had annual bike rides to bring people out. And these are different people participating in different ways. One guy sent me a photograph of the bike lane being painted. That was all he ever did. Um, and then someone made a nice banner saying, thanks for sharing the road. Uh, we need to make the issues relevant, identify what's at stake. Instead of announcing a meeting that says, you know, road improvement coming or environmental assessment, no one really knows what that is. So making it relevant, another time for your clickers. Uh, what's relevant in your community? Um, you can pick the top three here. So this one's a little more complex. I'll read them out. Uh, if you were going to go back to your community and say, we're having a public meeting tonight, in the back of your mind, you're talking about built environments and health, you've got some agendas, but you want to frame it in a way that's going to be of interest to your neighbors. Or there's a new road being reconstructed and you want to get your neighbors out to kind of talk about sidewalks and bike lanes, that kind of thing. So how would you frame it? Number one, climate change and air quality. Two, loss of farmland, habitat, rural character. Three, equity. Now, I, I didn't mean to focus on the road example. You may have other issues in your community like housing, whatever. But so um, equity could be access to diverse types of housing, parks. Number four, road danger, seniors and children's safety. Number five, traffic congestion. Six, physical activity. Seven, planning controls and curbing sprawl. Eight, trails, bike lanes, and greedways. Nine, you might have another issue that you think would resonate with your community. Okay, so the results are in. So equity is a big one. And trails, bike lanes, and greenways, yes. Those are pretty common, I think. And, and the trails are great because it tends to bring out a lot of people. And it's an entry point for people to get interested in this issue. So where is change coming? 
that's something you want to be on top of. New development, those are opportunities to get involved. Transportation projects, another great opportunity to get people involved. Uh, we should use our existing opportunities. If you've got a public meeting, here's one that happened. Only five people came. And they put this in the report, and I thought, wow, what a missed opportunity that was. Understanding the context, you can bring people out to the site. There's lots of ways, little tools to help you do an audit, a safety audit. Um, look at the research. So this is a research looking at barriers to physical activity here in Newfoundland Labrador. Cost, access, cost of transportation. Some of the acts, action um, that were suggested, travel subsidies, use of schools. And I wasn't sure if that region, you know, are they close by or are they regional schools? Is that going to be a challenge? Building infrastructure, does that include trails, walks, and parks? Um, doing a needs assessment, finding out what people want to do for physical activity. And more partnerships with organized sports groups. So organized sports groups don't typically include walkers and cyclists, but maybe they should. Um, some great research that was done by Catherine O'Brien, Richard Gilbert, Child and Youth Friendly Land Use and Transportation Planning Guidelines. So this stuff exists. It's a great resource. Finding out hotspots. I'm not sure if you keep statistics on where people are being hit. Uh, Web 2.0 is something we're using more and more now. I saw an article in the paper about a woman who was hit here in St. John's on Friday uh, at an intersection, a crosswalk. And there was lots of interesting comments coming in from, you know, after the article, which I find interesting. So having Web 2.0 is just another way of, for people to uh, have more of an interactive conversation. So inspiring people, that's a good strategy as well. Showing examples of what could be. So pedestrian streets, bikeways. 3D modeling is really helpful, I think, for people to understand. Um, not everyone reads a plan. So the image on the left shows a transformation from big box retail into, a, into what it could be. Ottawa has a great video up on the right on uh, their a new separated bikeway. And if you get a chance to check it out, it's just it's very, uh, very engaging. Before and after examples, the image on the top before bike lanes, bottom has bike lanes. This is a Photoshop, a wonderful tool. It looks so real, but this isn't, hasn't happened yet. But it gives you uh, an indication. This was public health wanted these to show their counselor about you know, what could be. Uh, and celebrating assets, there's always good work going on. There's the trails, folks. Um, showcasing those assets is a great way to bring other partners into a project. Um, some of the assets that I noticed here, the Avalon Peninsula is one of the uh, most popular routes for cycling in, in uh, Canada. And of course, the Grand Concourse, another great asset that you have here. What else do you have? You've got a lot of people who care. So People Energy, committed champions, researchers, staff, festival goers, enforcement officers, you folks. Uh, leaders and champions. So I don't know if you have any uh, political champions. This is a person who's in the paper recently in Ottawa. Um, looks like she's very supportive. You know, and I'd love to be in her department working under, uh, or you know, in her ward. Um, downtowns are often a great asset. You can show people right away what a walkable community looks like. This is uh, up in northern Ontario, but similar. There's a, a lot of stuff going on within a, in a one-kilometer uh, one walk. And you have a new cycling master plan, which I understand is uh, fairly fresh and could, probably could use some support. Um, you're doing school travel planning. Um, and I guess the, the trick is to get organized, so creating task forces, work, working groups, coalitions. There's a number of different ways to get organized. And accelerating the action. Make a plan or support a plan. Uh, you have some plans that, that are already underway. Other plans, walkability plan, cycling plan, active transportation plan, or sustainability plan. Developing an emerging picture of where things are at can be helpful in identifying gaps. So in one column, we've got all the stuff that's going on right now. In the middle, things we're working on today. And then what's left to do. It helps people get a, a sense of where things are at in a, in a quick way. And targeting infrastructure improvements around schools, community centers, seniors, buildings, pe places where people really need this infrastructure. In this case, we had apartment complexes, um, community centers, and, tr and a transit station. And the purple line is a trail. And people couldn't get to the trail. So the focus is on connecting those people into the trail. And having a plan is great because it's a little context for shovel-ready projects. So when the funding comes along, big or small, you can start to put things in place, like bike racks, uh, traffic calming, that kind of thing. Starting the improvements. 
Just a piece on resources. Everybody says, well, how is this going to cost a fortune? The cost of building an urban arterial road, expanding it, $1.3 million per kilometer, when compared to putting on a paved shoulder, $50,000 per kilometer. Um, I've included the slides, a number of resources, but road reconstruction projects, they're being built anyway. It doesn't cost a lot to include pedestrians and cyclists. What are the costs of not doing anything? New development is another opportunity to build new infrastructure. And recreation and leisure resources. So you're looking at your trails for not just recreation, but accessing a bag of milk. Um, Portland, Oregon is kind of similar weather-wise to St. John's. They've invested roughly $4 per person per year, and they've seen a 146% increase in, uh, percent increase in cycling. And uh, drivers have decreased by 5%. Planning policy, you have to ask yourself how you want to grow. This is the mayor of Mississauga who admits openly they made a big mistake. This is a, a sprawling suburb outside of Toronto. You need high-level commitment. So there are different ways of doing that. Getting the mayor to sign the International Charter for Walking is one way. There are other charters, complete streets policies. Um, this document is uh, something, that I'm not sure how old it is, but it speaks to your planning processes here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, I'd encourage you to read it. It has some good recommendations. Promoting smart growth. Just a few quick slides on what is smart growth. Basically, using the infrastructure that's already there. You've built the roads, the sewers, the water lines. The population is there. Take that old gas station or that old uh, service station lot and um, develop it. These are That was a gas station on the left, and on the right was a service station as well. So you've got smaller uh, living units above shops. So we refer to those typically as developing the brown fields or the gray fields, old uh, strip malls, that kind of thing. And using alternative development standards so we can break away from all the codes and things that have forced us to build the way we've been building in the last 20 years. These are new communities. Urban design guidelines help so that you know where the buildings are going to go, how high they're going to be. And transportation policy should start with mobility and not cars. Complete streets policy I mentioned earlier. Maintenance. How are we doing? Setting some indicators, like start to measure how we're doing in terms of our mode split, walkability. Is the plan healthy? I'll include this in the slides as well, but there's some great resources. The one on the bottom is like a checklist to help people who are new to planning understand what we should be looking for. Partnerships. I'm going to zip through these a bit and just get to some. I've got a number of players involved. Planners, recreation, public health, economic development, how do we pull all these folks together into one team to push this agenda? Some examples. This is a guide that was created for citizens so they can understand how to get engaged in the official planning process. Public health and planning work together on that. Uh, planning and public health work together on this as well. How to look at official plans. This was a forum that public health initiated with the planning department and the transportation engineers in Niagara region uh, to talk about what are the barriers, how can we accelerate things. Um, the first point there is how do we get the silent majority of supporters awakened to, to this issue. Uh, I mentioned checklists, and this is the, the last example. Um, for planners, what to look for in terms of public health. So public health wrote this up and gives it to planners when they're developing their official plans. Workshops I mentioned earlier. Zipping along, building a culture. This one is an ad from GM. This is what we're up against. So the little tagline on the bottom is stop pedaling, start driving. They're marketing this towards students, right? Get the GM card, get your car. And it was kind of fun, like the impact of social media, instead of reality sucks, you know, get a car, they've started to play with it. Reality sucks, so does being unfit, in debt, stuck in traffic, and paying through the wazoo for gasoline. <laughs> Other programs, um, bike parking, share the road campaigns. These are all part of the culture. Uh, delivery programs uh, for groceries. And last, opening the streets. So I heard from a shopkeeper yesterday that they used to close Water Street down for a party every year. They haven't done that for a while. And they was like, yeah, we should do that more often. So just in summary, talked about the health impacts, the characteristics of a healthy built community, and strategies for building a healthier community. Um, last survey question, 
before we wrap up here. How can we best accelerate supports for walking and biking? So, you know, pretty wild, open-ended question. Pick your top three. And I think, you know, I should have added one here, all of the above, but um, the first option is draft complete street communities, sorry, draft complete streets and communities policies. Number two, create more opportunities for interdepartmental and stakeholder collaboration. Number three, engage the public so they can learn, get involved, and advocate for change. Number four, allocate more funding. Number five, create active transportation plans. And number six, more events and fun to engage people. Engage the public. Interesting. Okay. Thank you very much for your uh, time. I apologize for going a little bit over. I think we have some... Uh, do we have time for questions? And I understand that if we can't uh, answer the questions here in this uh, discussion, I will attempt to answer them later on when they're forwarded to me electronically. So, great process. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I certainly know we have a lot of the potential partners in the room. A lot of the resources and skills are here, and we even have some of the political uh, minds in the room. We're going to take a couple of questions. We are running behind. We'll take a couple of questions. We will answer the questions online that don't get answered in the room. And Paul is around for the full conference. Yeah. And so just track him down and ask him questions. So, guys, here's your first question. Oh. oh, yeah, that's how this works, right. <laughs> there is no person. Uh, can the municipal planning process resolve or prevent problems from conflicting land use, land development uses, even if zoning allows it? Housing next to landfills. Yeah, so <clears throat> there are going to be uses that are incompatible, they call it in the planning lexicon, uh, incompatible uses that are going to need to be separated. In, in my neighborhood, we have a lot of heavy industry, and there's a lot of impacts that um, people experience every day from emissions to road dust to whatever. And um, I think it makes sense to have some of those uses close to where people are uh, working <laughs> so we don't have to travel huge distances to the sites. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think it makes sense to separate some of those heavy industrial uses out. And I think the planning process can resolve some of that. Next question. Yeah. Can the municipal planning process resolve or prevent? Oh, sorry. It's dangerous to walk in some communities. No sidewalks, poor snow clearing, poor lighting, etc. What can be done? Well, you know, having a sidewalk, period, is, is one way of, um, uh, you know, if there's no walk, that can be identified, uh, and, and I, it, typically it helps to get together as a group. So if, you can, if there's a group that can identify places where the walkways are missing, you know, in some kind of comprehensive way or rational way, take it to the transportation uh, planning department or your elected official and start to look at opportunities. So maybe there's a phased-in sidewalk replacement program where you can target these missing pieces. Um, and I think the danger part typically comes from not separating the users out. So if you've got cars mixed in with pedestrians, that, you know, typically there's no sidewalks. That creates the, the conflicts and the potential for injury. Um, poor snow clearing. I see some snow clearing here. I saw the machine going around yesterday. I think they've identified certain streets. Uh, maybe there's priority streets uh, for snow clearing. And I think... That there, maybe there's another level of detail that has to go into that discussion. So if, for example, there are vulnerable road users, uh, senior citizens, children, um, those could become priority streets as well. Uh, and then ultimately, if you can get some kind of clear your ice, in, in Toronto I think we call it be nice, clear your ice. That's the carrot, and the stick is you're fined if you don't remove the, the snow from your sidewalk after a certain amount of time. So municipal bylaws. Again, that would have to come from a group, I think, or, or a group like yourselves that would advocate for it. Um, 
poor lighting, <clears throat> similarly, depending on the context, um, you can typically get lighting levels increased if there's already a light fixture there by changing the, uh, the fixture, which is less costly. Um, then, you know, at the other end of the spectrum, you would have to put in uh, lighting, uh, what we call light standards, uh, to provide, you know, adequate levels of lighting. Um, and that is a, you know, a budgeting item, so you'd have to get in touch with whoever, whichever authority is in charge of that. Sometimes it's a park. Uh, so it would be under parks. Sometimes it's on a road. It would be under the, uh, typically the works department. I think, I think yeah? we're going to close down. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. We have a small token of our appreciation. Oh, thank you. It was, it's handcrafted. <laughs>